I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Is this on? Yeah, OK. So I'm. Oh, yeah. OK, so um, there's actually room. There's still a little bit of room in the front. And if there's seats in the middle, if people can actually sort of squeeze in so that there's actually, so the people that are coming in late can actually take a slight, uh, slight seat in the aisle, that would be great. OK, so I'm, gonna, I'm doing something a little bit uncharacteristic for myself. I'm actually going to start right on time, because I know that George has a lot of slides, and, and I want to give him time to get through all his talk. So, um, so welcome to the first of this summer's uh, four lecture, public lectures. Uh, my name is Leo Plank. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Genome Sciences. And I'm just going to take a couple of minutes at the beginning to make a few announcements and introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, and first, I just want to briefly mention that the reason we have this public lecture series is for you guys, basically. The goal here is to really kind of acquaint you with the kinds of things that are going on in the Department of Genome Sciences and to kind of give you a sense of where tax dollars are going. Although I just want to, for the fiscal conservatives out there, it's a really tiny, tiny fraction of the, the pie that we get from the federal government. Uh, getting smaller all the time, unfortunately. Um, OK, so but I don't want to diverge onto that topic. Um, so first, I just want to, uh, the second thing I want to mention is that the first two lectures in our series are actually going to be held here in this auditorium. Uh, the last two lectures are actually going to be held in another room. It's going to be the Hitchcock Hall, which is basically the um, brick building that's just to the east of the um, Fagey building. And the reason we have to have the last two there is because there's going to be renovations going on in this, in this lecture hall for the last, during the last half of July. So I'll try and remind you about this next week in case you want to come to the last two lectures as well. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that, um, uh, let's see. The, th the other thing I want to mention is at the end of this talk, there's going to be refreshments that are served right out in the lobby, right outside the lecture hall. And so the speaker, tonight's speaker, has graciously agreed to, if you guys have questions, and I don't give you enough time to ask all your questions at the end of his lecture, um, he's graciously agreed to stick around for a while so you guys can slip outside the lecture hall, grab yourself a refreshment, and don't be afraid to come up and ask him more questions. He's willing to ask, ask, answer all your questions, basically. Okay. OK, so I think those are the only things I really need to let you know. Um, yeah. So I actually, so we're really lucky to have George Martin as our speaker tonight. Um, I couldn't think of a better way to actually start off this summer's lecture to have, than to have him. He's been a real pioneer in the, the aging research field. So just a little bit about his background. Um, he received his Bachelor of Science and MD degrees here at the University of Washington. He then interned at Montreal General Hospital. He did his residency at the University of Chicago, and then he did uh, several different postdoctoral stints to where he got, he got immersed in, in research. Uh, I won't mention all of them. One he did at Glasgow University, where he worked on somatic cell genetics. Another one was at Oxford, where he studied embryology. And then he accepted a faculty position here at the University of Washington. His uh, primary appointment is in the Department of Pathology, but he's also an adjunct member of the Genome Sciences Department as well. Um, so, as I mentioned, Dr. Martin's been a, a real pioneer in aging re research, and in particular, genetic approaches to aging research, which we'll hear more about tonight. Um, he's been the recipient of way, way too many honors and awards for me to mention them all. I could spend 15 minutes reading them. I've never seen such an impressive list of honors and awards. I'll just mention a few very, very quickly, but I, this doesn't even scratch the surface of the number of awards he's received. He's received a World Alzheimer's Congress Lifetime Achievement Award. He's received an American Aging Association Research Medal and Distinguished Scientist Award. He was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, and he now serves as a senior member. He served on the scientific advisory boards of lots of different places, including the Ellison Medical Research Foundation. And I could go on and on and on, OK? I also just add that George has had a tremendous influence at the University of Washington. Uh, and, I, and again, I could just go on and on and on here. I'll just mention two of the things he's really been instrumental in. He is one of the founding directors of the uh, Medical Scientist Training Program, which trains uh, people in medicine and in basic science. These people receive their MD and PhD degrees, so he's one of the founding directors of that program here. Uh, he's also the founder of the Genetic Approaches to Aging Training Grant that's probably supported the research activities of literally hundreds of people here, including several people in my own lab. So that's actually been a really incredible contribution. And again, I could go on and on and on here. So I could basically take his CV, hand it to anybody in the audience, and it would be absolutely apparent that he's had an enormous impact in science and at the university. But the last thing I want to mention is something you wouldn't get from reading his CV, and that is that George is really an incredibly 
he's just a terrific guy. He's one of the nicest people you'd ever meet. He's incredibly hum humble. He's just a really positive guy. He's very encouraging of his younger faculty. He's just been one of the greatest colleagues I've met here at the university. He's just really a tremendous guy. And you wouldn't get that from reading his CV. You just have to meet him to know that. And I think you'll get a sense of that by the end of lecture today. So I'm just going to finish by saying that um, as a faculty member, I feel like I'm really lucky to have him as a colleague. And I'm just going to tell you guys, you guys are tremendously lucky to get a chance to hear him speak about his work tonight. So, so with further, no further ado, uh, uh, George Martin. Thanks so much, Leo. Uh, wonderful introduction. I wish I had all my grandchildren here, but they're spread out all over the place. And uh, I wish you could hear Leo sometime. Leo is making a great contribution to a very important subject in uh, biology and pathobiology of aging, namely Parkinson's disease. And he works on fruit flies. You can learn a lot from the genetics of fruit flies, and he's doing us a great service. That's a very common disorder. So. I'm going to give a little prologue before I get, get into the substantive stuff of the, uh, the title here, just to say in advance, by nature, I mean your genetics, what you're born with, both constitutional genetics and things that happen during your life genetically. And by nurture, that means your environment, very important, and they interact. Genes interact with each other, and uh, things in the environment are constantly interacting with genes. So it's hard to tease out. And then something recently I've been very interested in towards the end of my career are chance events, or you might say stochastic events. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'll get into that as well. But first, a little bit of the, the background here of how I got interested in this business anyway. And I have some people to thank he, who are here tonight, uh, Arno Matulski and Stan Gartler. I noticed Stan Gartler, they're both professors in genetics, and uh, Arno uh, both turned 90 years of age recently. We had a wonderful birthday party for them. Uh, Stan, I couldn't get a younger picture of Stan here, but as a matter of fact, he's a few months older, so I thought I'd, I'd uh, stick with that. And their spouses, you know, science is very much a social kind of enterprise. And so when I was a young, naive pathologist trying to get interested in genetics, I was welcomed by all these people and Herschel and their spouses. So they invited us for dinners and uh, with visiting scientists and it was a, a wonderfully exciting experience. Carol Roman, Gretel Matulski, and Marion Gartler. So now also Ben Hall, I don't think Ben is here right now, helped me a lot when I started the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. I wanted to do genetics and find, we had, I knew that Tom Bird had, a colleague had a lot of pedigrees in which it went from generation to generation. And uh, we, we had uh, recruited uh, Ellen Weissman from Stanford is a statistical geneticist, and we wanted to go tackle that problem. Uh, and so uh, I was missing a molecular genetics. And so uh, uh, we, we had a discussion, and it was suggested that I get this young man, Jerry Schellenberg, uh, who then went on to lead a team to clone two of the three dominant genes that make for very early onset Alzheimer's disease, and now Jerry's in Pennsylvania and very successful scientist. So that was very gratifying. And Samir Deeb, another colleague, uh, he had to teach Jerry Schellenberg some basic methodology early on. So the Department of Genome Science has been very good to me and very good to our field. So now I want to tell you, going back a minute, I had a discussion with Herschel uh, Roman and I had been doing some reading about, uh, of all things, about vanadium. Why vanadium? It gets you an idea of how one thing leads to another. I was interested in a, a rare genetic disease called Wilson's disease, which affects the liver and the brain. And these poor people store a lot of copper, and it damages cells. It's called a hepatolenticular degeneration. And so I was 
we didn't know the cause then. Many, many years later, it turned out it's due to a mutation in the transporter of copper, uh, uh, particularly in the liver cells. Uh, and you can't get rid of your copper in the bile and the GI tract. Uh, so um, I knew that there was a diagnostic methodology. There was an enzyme called ceruloplasmin. Cerulo means blue. And uh, it had a lot of copper in it and it was very low in these patients. And uh, copper is what they call, a pros uh, or metals can be a prosthetic group that joins a protein. And I thought, well, vanadium would be interesting. Is that a prosthetic group of other enzymes? I read the literature and I discovered that it's essential for some simple organisms. And I looked into fun fungi and I discovered research by this wonderful guy, Keto Pontecorvo, who was my mentor in somatic cell genetics. I went to the University of Glasgow in 1961 to work with him because Herschel wrote a nice letter and I was immediately accepted. Uh, and he had, he, he had been uh, discovered something called the parasexual cycle. He could map genes just by reproduction, not by sex but by things called mitotic recombination, the shuffling of the genetic material. And uh, one is called mitotic crossing over, and Stan Gartler is uh, one of his professors at the University of Colorado, uh, Kurt Stern, studied that in fruit flies. And so I said, he, he was the one who suggested, wow, we could now map human genes. And I, it was a desert of, mutant gene, of human genes. We didn't know where they were on the autosomes, the non-sex chromosomes. We knew something about the sex chromosome genes. So I was really excited about that. And so we took off with the whole family in our Volvo, little kids. Uh, but meanwhile, I wanted work to go on in my lab. And so uh, <laughs> back in Seattle, Bill Pendergrass was a graduate student. I shared with uh, Paul Pendergrass, Ray Monat, who's now a full professor in, in genome sciences uh, and in pathology, and Tom Norwood, who's now a full professor. Uh, he was a graduate student, but he never wrote his thesis. <laughs> but he's, he's had a, had a great career, and he, he's the main teacher of our medical students in pathology. So, so they did carry on a little bit. But now back in Glasgow, I ran into big trouble. It turns out when you do microbial genetics with bacteria, you do things like you make multiple plates and you have to take a clone and make a subclone and a subclone. I couldn't do it. The cells stopped growing. And about that time, this, I was there in the summer of 61, and in 1961, later on, Leonard Hayflick and Paul Moorhead published a paper and said, that guy who won the Nobel Prize years ago by showing that cells can be grown uh, forever, he was wrong. <laughs> he was just uh, um, putting in some extract from chickens that had cells in it, so it kept on and on. Yeah. So he said they all stopped growing after a while. So I said, you know, since I couldn't do this, I thought maybe this is biologically significant. And I remembered that I, back in Seattle, uh, Arnold Matulski had a fellow, Charles Epstein, who uh, came to me and said, George, we need a pathologist for this very interesting project. They had in the medical, in the clinic, they had two sisters who had this disease called the Werner syndrome after a, a German, Otto Werner, who described it in, when he was a medical student. He found people who were, uh, had, had gray hair and short stature and cataracts. He was in the ophthalmology service, actually, as a medical student. And uh, we now know osteoporosis and uh, atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, uh, diabetes mellitus, and cancer. We've had patients with five different kinds of cancer. So it accelerates some process which I call progeroid. It's like aging, but we can't be sure it's exactly like aging. So it, it actually, uh, Charlie died of a pancreatic carcinoma, when was it, a year, a year or so ago. And uh, he was involved in the unit a bomber problem. They sent him a bomb, and unfortunately, it just exploded, didn't kill him, and he lost some hands. Uh, he was a very distinguished geneticist. So there's one patient. She's 15 years old here, 48 years old, so you can see uh, she's in trouble. So it took me many years, but I, I got pieces of skin from patients and from the controls of different ages, and I passage them and passage them, see how long they would grow, cumulative population doublings. And it turned out that here's a Werner syndrome. 
they are two to three standard doublings be below the mean of their age group. So they really suggested to me, maybe there's something to this slowing down of cell replication. We, there's a long story I don't have to get into, I don't have time, but we now think that um, that, uh, it, that the autopsy material shows us better a decline with age. We think there are stem cells in the dermis and that after autopsy they take a hit and uh, they, they express, we, we see less replication. So uh, in 1996, uh, uh, Cheng En Yu and Junko Oshima, Junko Oshima is a close colleague, she's here tonight. Uh, they were first, first authors of a paper in which they found the gene uh, for Werner's syndrome, and it turns out to be a, a member of a family of helicases, the REC-Q family. And what, what uh, helicases do is unwind double-stranded DNA. If you want to do business with DNA, you've got to get your protein machinery in there, and you've got to unwind it first. So that business could be to replicate it, to copy it, to recombine it, to repair it where it's damaging. So that was very gratifying. Uh, and so it, my friend Larry Loeb uh, studied uh, uh, what kind of substrates does it like. A substrate is what the enzyme works on. It turns out it likes DNA pieces that are in trouble, that are weird. So for example, uh, this is at the ends of, of, uh, of chromosomes and telomeres. They, they make a, a, tetra, a tetraplex, uh, these strands in this uh, shape here, some four duplex, D-loops, and uh, some intermediate in recombination. So they're very important to, to keep your uh, DNA in good shape. Now, I'll finish this story very quickly to tell you what's happened over the years. Judy Campisi, a good colleague of mine at the University of California in the Buck Institute there in Novato, uh, has shown that these old cells that accumulate, when they get out of the cycle, they don't die. Uh, they just sit there and they secrete all kinds of uh, gene products. Uh, and she calls these the secretory associated uh, phenotype. This, I'm sorry, the senescent associated phenotype. They, they secrete things like enzymes, metalloproteinase that change the connective tissue, and mitogens that stimulate epithelial cells to proliferate. And she thinks that it's, a, uh, uh, it's good for you when you're young because it may stop cancer, but later on it starts secreting these things that get you into trouble. Uh, so now, this very recently from the Mayo Clinic, a group of people uh, decided to try to knock out the old cells in the body. And uh, there's a particular marker called P16, Inc. 4A, that tells you this is an old cell. And they had a trick where they had uh, a promoter which drives the gene uh, to express uh, that, uh, that particular gene, and they had a chemical that when they added to it, it, it killed the cell. Only the cells which were old, and the dramatic effects on, on the phenotype. This is a, a, a control of a, a senescent mouse. It had, a, it had an aberration such that they had chromosomal abnormalities, and this is uh, the one where they knocked out the cells. So there's a lot of interest in what, how we can do to get rid of it. Now, it's not 100% because they do one good thing at least, these old cells. They help in wound healing when they secrete their material. So nothing is 100%. So here, finally, we're going to go into um, our, our uh, lecture topic. I'm going to talk about how do we define aging different ways, and why should we do research on the biology of aging? Then I'm going to talk about Look, why should we age? Think of development. Boy, that is really a miracle to make from a sperm and an egg a zygote and develop. If you can do that, it seems like it's a slam dunk to keep us going for a long time. So we'll talk about that. And then why do creatures age so differently? which is um, something I'm very interested in. So we have the role of genetics, nature, the role of the environment, nurture. And I'm going to spend a little time on that. And then this business of chance events, lady luck, stochastic events. So now, here's some definitions. First, the humorous. Well, aging is like pornography. You know it when you see it. <laughs> That's, so you can look at me. Um, a lot of you could guess that, well, I'm 86. Be nice and say, look, only maybe 76 or so, but you know I'm old. 
So the philosopher says man was created half to rise, half to fall. It's the famous Alexander Pope. The demographer, it's a more scientific explanation, and this Samuel Gompertz, way back in 1825, used that definition. Uh, it's an exponential probability of death. That is, the rate of increase of dying as you get older it goes steep curve. It's not a linear curve uh, with chrono, uh, and it's in, starts post-reproductively after individuals. Uh, are finished with their reproduction. Physicists, they like the notion of entropy, which is a, a term of th thermodynamic disorder in your complicated molecules. Botanists, they, they're different than the mammalian gerontologists. They say, well, aging is everything from the beginning to the end, but the gerontologists, the way they do their experiments, they start to look at the, at the time an individual is mature, a mammal is mature, and it's sexually active, and then look from there. However, it's very important for us to keep in mind that how well you build an organism makes a big difference in how long it lasts and, and how, how well it functions. So I think of us as kind of protein synthesizing machines. So you want to make the factory really good, and then you want to do a lot of good quality controls. So here's a definition that in uh, my last postdoc was at the uh, Rockefeller University with, with uh, Josh Lederberg and when wonderful working with him, uh, Nobel Prize winning geneticist. And we said it was de deleterious, non-adaptive, it's not good for you, changes in structure and function after the peak of reproduction. There are some individuals who argue that it is adaptive and will maybe spend a little time talking about that. And it's good if you have some ideas about, uh, um, about a how aging should work on an evolutionary um, basis. You would like to have people taking pot shots at you and having different views. Now I'm going to get to the next question. Next question is, why do basic research on the biology of aging anyway? So here is um, a, 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 a concept developed by my friend and colleague Jay Olshansky from the University of, of Illinois and with contributions by Rich Miller from, from Michigan. If just like to take, consider, consider a, a female, a 50-year-old female, who should live statistically to age 81. Now, what happens if you just cure cancer? National Cancer Institute has a big budget. Well, you get a little bit of an increase. Let's see what happens when you cure disease, uh, heart disease. Maybe a bit more. Together, you do a little bit better, but look what happens here. There's an experiment that we did with a graduate student in genome sciences named Sam Schreiner. We put uh, a enzyme from humans called catalase uh, and made it go where it doesn't usually go, to mitochondria. And there's a lot of interest in what is called the oxidative damage or free radical theory of aging. And so this enzyme chews up a uh, bad guy, hydrogen peroxide, which when the iron is ar uh, around, it makes something called the Fenton reaction, and it makes hydroxyl radicals, which are very dangerous, and they, they, they hit DNA, they hit proteins, they hit lipids, and so on. So uh, uh, compared to controls, where we put it to the nucleus and to where it usually is the peroxisomes, uh, these mice lived longer. So that was very gratifying. And actually, another graduate student of mine, uh, Peter Rabinovich, who's doing a superb job leading a research in biology here at the University of Washington, he got the very first center in the nation called the nation, Nathan Shock Center of Excellence from the National Institute on Aging. And I, uh, I bragged to my uh, guys, who, my friends, who got the second institute at San Antonio that we were first. Turns out that we were voted in about 10 seconds or so before San Antonio, <laughs> but we were number one. So Peter now is following that work, and he's working with uh, uh, a colleague uh, named Hazel Zetto at Cornell University and some chemists, and they're doing some amazing things they've, uh, in terms of health, keeping mitochondria healthy. Uh, they discovered that there is a small 
what's called a tetrapeptide, four amino acids, which they synthesize, which zeroes in on mitochondria in, in, in the membrane, inner membrane, with a molecule called cardiolipin a molecule, uh, and changes its, we think, its uh, structure. And it protects mice who are aging from uh, a, a common form of a diastolic heart failure. And there's clinical trials now in humans both with ischemic heart failure, the usual kind from coronary artery disease, and with non-ischemic heart, heart disease, which is becoming very important, which may involve mitochondria. So that's very gratifying. But the, also the, the best way to slow down aging in multiple, multiple species is to cut down on, on, on uh, diet, diet intake. Uh, mostly calories, but it's not only calories. You can limit an amino acid methionine. And these animals typically live, in the case of mouse, for example, most strains of mice, if you limit uh, calories by 40%, you increase the lifespan 50%. So that recently we know that depends upon the gene genotype. Some mice uh, don't do, they do worse on that uh, regimen. And if you go to non-human primates like rhesus monkeys, uh, you've got to bring it down to 30%. So uh, it's a matter of, uh, like everything in life, everything is a dose response. You have to have the right uh, uh, amount of intervention for the right person and the right that's personalized medicine. That would be the future, I would say. Actually, uh, Jay Olshansky got a, a telephone call from a member of the White House Office of Technology and Science, or Science and Technology, um, and wanted to consider uh, this concept, which he calls longevity dividend. If you work on aging, you're going to you're going to work on everything at the same time, multiple diseases, and so maybe we'll be a candidate for a grand challenge. We we'll keep our fingers crossed, we'll across because we might get some money for it. Another argument I like to make is that maybe we're not living long enough to solve really big problems. So, um, and they're not for, I would say we need a heck of a lot more social scientists, quantitatively based social scientists, uh, to tackle problems that are going on now in Egypt, in Syria, and Afghanistan, in Iraq. Uh, how, uh, social psychology, what's the science be uh, behind uh, 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 group conflicts, group conflicts, labor management, group conflicts, international relations, uh, political conflicts, and so on. And in a way, if it's human behavior, to understand human beha behavior in groups, you have to understand human behavior in individuals. If you have to understand it in individuals, then you have to know biology. So, and you have to start with math, and those are the youngest guys, and go from math to chemistry and physics, and then from chemistry and physics to biology, biology uh, to medicine, and then social science. We don't live long enough to get master more than one or two disciplines. So that's one theoretical argument. So now I'm going to get into why we should, uh, why are we aging? So uh, here's a, a cartoon that I drew to give you uh, the basic idea of what I call the classical evolutionary biology, biological theory of aging. So the idea is imagine there are a bunch of field mice. And um, most field mice do not make it after one winter in the wild. Uh, and so here, these brown guys, there should be even a larger number of them in this diagram to represent what's really happening in the population. Uh, here's, here's a couple of them that made it miraculously through the first winter because of lots of predators, feline, barn owls, infections, accidents, starvations. And here's one that may be, uh, made it two years. So imagine the, the, the uh, variety of genes that these guys have here. Imagine he has a variety that and he has a variety that's potentially really good for you and make you live longer, what's the probability that that gene uh, variant or an allele would go into the next gene pool? Very unlikely. Why? Because it's completely swamped by all these guys. They're diluting it out. That's the basic idea is that uh, phenotypes that, that are, are expressed late after reproduction, nature doesn't care about you too much. 
So uh, it escapes the force of natural selection. And of course, there's some tricks in evolution. Uh, the, the development of flight, that's great because birds can ex escape predators and they can find new food sources. And uh, turtles, they get into their shell and they live really long. They're protected against predators and maybe uh, I'm not so sure about this, but we're smart enough to survive, um, and we we, divined, uh, we developed tools and so on. That might be our way of living longer. So now this is this business I've been talking about is quantitated by first by William Hamilton and Brian Charlesworth, uh, and this this here in this uh, y-axis it's a mathematical construct called a partial derivative of something called the Malthusian. Uh, parameter. So don't worry about it. Basically, it's just a way to show the force of natural selection. And basically, uh, it's gone by middle age. They don't care about you by middle age. And it's interesting, if you do biological assays, like uh, find out how well people do on marathons as a function of age, uh, it kind of parallels that, uh, that curve in the opposite way. Uh, if you test for records for uh, sprints, they tend to be in the 20s. But in marathon, you have to have some wisdom and experience at how you, how you uh, run a marathon. But it goes, it, it, it's the loss of, of the power of natural selection continues on that way. So that leads to another definition. Somebody said, I thought maybe that's the end of my talk. Not quite yet. OK. So, uh, Another way to think about a definition, these are phenotypes that have escaped the force of natural selection, or they're byproducts, epiphenomena, side effects of gene actions that evolved to enhance reproductive fitness in a particular ecological niche. Okay. Okay. So, so now let's get to this business of why creatures age so differently. We start with nature, but the nature where you're comparing different species, not within a species. I'm going to start interspecific variations. And I've made this Venn diagram uh, to illustrate the notion that here, if you're comparing mice and men, uh, the, big, the big factor is the nature, your constitutional genome. So, uh, and so therefore, I'm going to, if the Office of Science and Technology gives us a call, I'm going to say, oh, I two billion for that, one billion for nurture, one billion uh, for chance, and uh, okay, did I get, did I get one? Yeah, one million for George. Okay. <laughs> so now, if, this is a no-brainer. If, if you think of, we talked about caloric restriction or dietary restriction you do with a mouse, you get a 50% increase in lifespan. Wow. But hey, look what evolution does. Evolution beats it. Uh, so it's the genes in evolution that make a difference. And I'm very excited about the prospects of comparative genomics, and in which you could compare species that are phylogenetically closely related, but have quite different health uh, lifespans, but also health spans. And so here's a recent uh, discovery that's exciting. Turns out that the naked mole rat uh, ugly creature burrows underground. It's about the size of a mouse. It lives over 30 years. The record is at least 32 years. And uh, mice maybe live three or four years or so of the same size. And so uh, they virtually never get a cancer. In fact, uh, Shelley, uh, uh, a, friend, a friend of mine in um, San Antonio who's been studying this for some time, uh, done hundreds of autopsies and uh, there's only one possible lesion. So this is amazing to not have cancer. Mice are constantly having cancer. So last month there was a paper from um, Vera Gorbanova, who was a Russian exile, who's a, a scientist at the University of Rochester and her group, and they discovered that they seem to make a variety of a polysaccharide that has, that's a, a whole group of sugars Put together, it's uh, hyaluronan or hyaluronic acid, and it's uh, very important, apparently, from her studies, of 
not allowing cells to crowd up and proliferate too much. It's called contact inhibition. And that may be one important way in which they have learned how to uh, prevent cancer. And it's related to their skin because underground they have to, they have, to have an elastic skin as they crawl so that it's to have that, a lot of that big polysaccharide in their skin as well. Now, the other thing that's fascinating is that the question, how come we live twice as long as a chimpanzee? And we now have this, uh, the whole genome sequence of both organisms. Now, we know it's almost certainly not due to differences in their proteins, their enzymes, and so on, which goes all the way back to a member of our genome sciences department, uh, Mary Claire King and she worked with Alan Wilson. And they, in those days, you could sequence proteins. And they sequence the proteins and they're virtually identical. Uh, so uh, they suggested that, hey, it must be genes that are important in regulating the expression of other genes. And so now there's a, a first crack at this is by this gal, Katie Pollard, not for aging. I wish I could talk her into studying aging, but she's interested in neuroscience. So this is um, a paper, first of a series of papers, in which she asked the question, okay, which uh, domains of, of DNA, uh, and most of the DNA is not coding for proteins, it's coding for RNA, which are lots of different kinds of RNA that are presumably very important regulating or orchestrating a gene expression. Uh, which of them from a precursor six million years ago of the two lineages of, of chimpanzee and human, uh, which are, are evolving very rapidly in us, but not in the chimpanzees. And so the first hit that she got was these RNAs, which have this hairpin construction. And uh, she had a colleague who is very good at in situ um, uh, hybridization uh, where you can see where in the brain and when in the brain this is expressed or is it expressed? Yes, it's expressed and it's expressed in a particular subset of neurons called Cajal Retzius neurons and it's co-expressed with a very important compound called Relin which is a candidate gene in schizophrenia and it's expressed between an embryogenesis between about seven weeks and 19 weeks, guess what that is? It's when you're making the six layers of the cerebral cortex. So it must be one of the genes in regulation that evolved to make us cognitively better uh, in many ways. And now we should do the same thing for aging. It would be very exciting. So this comparative uh, genomics, and we have a new term for it now, comparative geroscience. Uh, in which uh, you can look at pathways, genetic biochemical pathways, when you tweak them, like making a, a, a leaky mutation. Uh, can you get a difference in lifespan and health span? We don't know, and these are simple organisms, yeast, uh, a, a worm, Cenorhabditis elegans, fruit flies, mice, and there's not great evidence, a little evidence in humans. And it turns out that all these pathways, when you tweak them with a, a certain mutation, uh, it's an insulin-like growth factor uh, 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 pathway, you can get substantial increases in lifespan. So that's, that's quite exciting. It's a little bit of an oversimplification because a lot of other pathways interacting with that. So now, if that wasn't complicated enough, look at this one. So this is the, the two sister pathways called mTOR, and where does that come? TOR means a target of rapamycin. Where does rapamycin come from? Well, it comes from Easter Island. Rapa Nui is the Polynesian name for Easter Island. And oh, I think it was 1964, some Canadian scientists were interested in the health of these people, Polynesian people, and they discovered in soil bacteria that made an antibiotic, and they called it rapamycin. And so, uh, there's a, a, a study by, supported by the National Institute on, on Aging, and there are three different laboratories that are working collaboratively on it, and they test various things, even aspirin. So somebody suggested to test this, and by the time they got the rapamycin in a form where they could give it in the diet, uh, the mice were getting old, so they were like us at 60 years of age, and they gave it, so what, we'll give it anyway, and it turns out they get substantial increases in lifespan. So that's quite exciting, and it seems to work in this pathway here, 
And so uh, people are look, uh, trying rapamycin in various conditions and seeing uh, how, at what dose they get what response. Uh, so it's, you know, there, there are complications also. If you give rapamycin very early uh, to uh, in a, a life of a mouse, it gets cataracts prematurely and it gets testicular degeneration. So it's not a slam dunk for us, but it's an exciting area to pursue. So now, uh, finally, how do we, now we're going from comparing species to within a species, intraspecific, what makes us so different? Uh, so I'm going to start with chance first because it's more controversial. And so I'm going to stick my neck out here in this Venn diagram. And I'm going to say that chance is the most important thing in why we differ so much in age. And why do I say that? Uh, oh, I want another million for that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to forget that. So uh, actually, I got interested in this for many years. I was interested in how come our mice, mouse colonies, they're inbred. Uh, mice, how come they're so different in how long they live? And some of them get lymphomas early and some get lymphomas late, uh, and their health span is different also. So uh, Stan Gartler asked me to uh, write a commentary on a paper in PNAS uh, by a group of Mexican uh, scientists, uh, not Mexican, I'm sorry, from Madrid in Spain, uh, Fraga et al. And uh, they were comparing twins, uh, human twins that were young, human twins that were middle-aged, human twins that were old, m multiple parameters they looked at to see how they're different. And this shows something called a gene expression uh, array where they're looking at some genes that are high, some genes that are low, and comparing the, the two twins. And so if you have a three-year-old, not so much difference. You have a 50-year-old, lots of difference. Some, these are overexpressed, these are underexpressed. And they came to the conclusion that uh, uh, this was probably due to environment, and almost certainly environment is making a big impact. But in a, my commentary, uh, which I'll show, I'll show you a, 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 in a moment, uh, a little bit more about that, uh, I suggested that maybe this is due to a drift of gene expression during aging. Now, at first I have to tell you what epigenetic is, right? Who knows what epigenetic, we had high school students here, do you know what epigenetics mean? Oh, we, so I have to tell you what that means on top of the genes. So um, a, a, genes have, uh, uh, are the same in our liver and our brain and elsewhere. So what makes them different is how they're expressed. And there are molecular ways to do that that don't change the actual letters in the, uh, in the DNA. So they can, for example, there are islands called CPG islands, cytosine, phosphate, guanine, and they are, uh, uh, can have a methyl group put on them that quiets the gene. And then on uh, proteins that are around the DNA called histone proteins, you could have marks on those, like an amino acid lysine could be methylated, and uh, uh, there's acetylation going on, post-translational modifications in proteins, and that makes a big difference in the expression. So it's, it's, there are changes that are going on uh, that are not due uh, to the uh, changes in the actual letters that are indicating the code, but their ability to express that. So now, I pointed out in that commentary, using a different graph actually, that if you take, the best example is Cenorhabditis elegans, a little nematode, a worm that's uh, studied a lot here at the University of Washington. And if you look at a, here is called a wild type strain, a normal strain, and this is a histogram, which says the number of worms and their lifespan in days. Uh, so you see quite a w range of variation. And then uh, there, the first mutation that produced an increased lifespan was done by a graduate of our uh, genetics department, Tom Johnson, who uh, has been in Colorado and, and most of his career at Boulder. And this is called age one, and they live quite a lot longer. But look at, look at the overlap. There's some of them that don't do as well. And these worms are identical twins. They're hermaphrodites. So, uh, and moreover, there are people uh, that can grow them uh, in a suspension culture. 
Uh, the medium is not identical, but it's very reproducible. And so they're spinning around and they're seeing the same temperature exactly, the same food exactly, the same waste material, and you see the same thing, enormous variation. So uh, uh, after reading those papers, my colleague Jan Vich, who's a Dutchman who moved to um, uh, the United States, he's now chair of genetics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, he decided to look cell to cell to cell in a mammal to see the difference in gene expression. And he took a heart, uh, the, 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 uh, the cells in the heart muscle, they're out of uh, replication with rare exceptions. So he took single cells and by uh, a methodology called uh, polymerase chain reaction, he could measure the amount of message from the genes that were made in a young mouse uh, six months of age, and in an old mouse, 24 months of age. And this is uh, the standard deviation uh, variegation that you see in a young, in red, and this is in old. And this is four of about 24 different genes that he was interrogating. And you can see there's drift. There's, they, the old ones have more variation in their expression. So I, I wrote a, a little theoretical paper which I called epigenetic gambling and epigenetic drift as an antagonistic pleiotropic mechanism of aging. And I have to explain all that language to you. Uh, so epigenetic gambling, I, I had a notion that it's actually uh, one of my colleagues who's going to come here at the University of Washington as a new member of our faculty, Daniel Promislow. Uh, I had him review the paper before I submitted it, and he said, George, there's a good name for epigenetic gambling that you should know about, that we have hundreds of papers written about it. It's called bet hedging, and that's what the evolutionary biologist. So I had to learn more about bet hedging, but I call it epigenetic gambling. Uh, it's a way to hedge your bets. And so my notion was that if you're a worm, and uh, you're going through dirt or in snails in a, let us say, a toxic dump in New Jersey. I like to use New Jersey because I tease some friends I have in New Jersey. Uh, and, and you hit, let us say, cadmium, which is very dangerous substance, very toxic. Uh, if everything is in lockstep in terms of gene expression, uh, you're in potential trouble because there are at least a couple of uh, classes of genes that are very important in protecting you from heavy metal toxicity. One is called metallothionine, and the other is a, a drug a resistance uh, uh, gene that can spit out this stuff out, out of the cell. So if you have, occasionally you have uh, a gambling that gambles to put a lot of uh, gene expression in that metallothionine, uh, you might not be as reproductively good in your normal environment, but in that environment you're going to live and you'll have some babies. So uh, that's the basic notion that if once, once you start it, the other notion is once you start with that variegated gene expression, uh, then it has a life of its own and you have more variegation, more variegation as you saw in that slide, and then you can really get into trouble. Now what do I mean by antagonistic pleiotropic? It means that Pleiotropy means that uh, a gene can do a lot of different things, simply that, multiple effects. So antagonistic means that it does some good things and bad things. So here the idea, it does some good things early in your lifespan, that's what is selected for, but bad things late. And it may be that the variegation might be good for the group in early lifespan, but uh, uh, potentially very dangerous. Uh, so it's just a theory, it's not by any means proven, and we're doing some experiments about that now. So I'm going to give you an example of what could happen in the context of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is one of many, many geriatric pathologies which I call quasi-stochastic. What do I mean by that? I mean that it's true there are particular tissues that take a big hit. Uh, and you uh, particularly see it in the case of Alzheimer's disease in a part of the brain called the medial temporal cortex, particularly in the hippocampus. It's very important in memory. But you can find it elsewhere as well. But within those susceptible areas, uh, it's kind of hit and miss where you see the canonical lesions. The canonical lesions are deposits of a small peptide of amino acids called beta amyloid, which comes from a precursor protein, and the small peptide can be anywhere from 
typically 32 to 43 amino acids, and is one particularly bad guy that has 42 amino acids uh, that is toxic, and probably toxic mostly as what we call oligomers, when uh, this simple unit gets together uh, to form maybe six units, and they probably attack the synapses, the connections between neurons, and that seems to be a key type of pathology. There's other pathologies called tau. Uh, it's a, a microtubular associated protein that the microtubules are the railroad tracks where things are going back and forth in the, uh, uh, in the, in the cell. And so there are ways to process that big precursor protein. There's kind of, a, you need some A beta, a little bit of it. It does some good things, and we're still searching for what good things it does. Uh, but if you get too much of it, you're in trouble. So now the alpha secretase is a proteolytic enzyme that cuts it, that A beta sequence more or less in the middle. So that's good. You're not going to get a pileup of A beta. Now there are two other enzymes called beta secretase and gamma secretase. And those are the guys that cut it out very nicely. And it's interesting that of those three uh, three dominant genes that have been discovered so far that make people get Alzheimer's disease very early, as early as 38 is a record so far that I know about, uh, instead of in the 80s. Uh, they have mutations in the beta amyloid precursor protein. They have mutations in gamma secretase and a pre called presenilin 1 is one of the components. Presenilin 2 is the other component. So it really gives strong support for that. Now there are things that chew up the A beta, enzymes that chew it up, proteolytic enzyme. One is called neprilysin and the other is called insulin degrading enzyme. And this is an oversimplification. There are other actors here as well. So I can imagine uh, that uh, the green arrows show excursions up or down in expression that are not too dangerous. Uh, the red arrows show things that are more prone to make too much of this nasty stuff, A beta, particularly 1 to 42. And uh, this is a young, this is a middle aged, this is an old. And this is taken from a famous diagram by Waddington, a geneticist who first dis uh, described epigenetics. And this is his uh, landscape in which he has a marble ro rolling down different pathways. So one marble rolls down to make a liver cell and another a neuron cell epigenetically. And so I'm arguing that there may be bumps in this Waddington uh, landscape during aging. And sooner or later, you get a, a jackpot. You get a perfect storm. And you get them all in the direction, so you're going to get the lesion right, right there in that particular spot, not next door. That's a theory, and it's a testable theory we're interested in looking at. So now uh, I just, since. John Gallant is here. I have to say that there are other uh, mechanisms for chance events. Uh, he spent a lot of years looking at this idea, protein synthesis error catastrophe, and did some brilliant experiments uh, showing that it's very unlikely to be a general mechanism. What that means, if you make a mistake in, uh, in manufacturing a protein during the, the step called translation, if it's a collagen molecule, a structural molecule, it doesn't make too much difference if there's an odd mistake. But if it's a molecule that's important in making other proteins, then you potentially could have a vicious cycle. So that's another possibility. Now, somatic mutation is very well established. I don't have time to get into that. We spent a lot of time in our lab uh, showing that somatic mutation is important. In fact, the Verna syndrome with Ray Monat, uh, we showed that uh, there's an increase between 10 and 100 times more in the rate of somatic mutation in those patients than in normal. So that's certainly important. So now uh, I want to talk. Oh, in the next few minutes quickly about environment. And uh, uh, I was invited to give a talk at the American Toxicological Society some years ago. And I s told these guys, well, you're interested in mutagens that cause mutations. You're interested in clastogens which break chromosomes. You're interested in carcinogens that cause cancer. Teratogens which make for congenital abnormalities They're in, uh, in the fetus. Uh, how about gerontogens? There may be agents there. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to really um, make a difference in, in toxicology research, uh, open it all up. So uh, I gave a definition 
putative environmental agents that may modulate the times of onset or the rates of development of specific aspects of the senescent phenotype. And I recently looked to see how much of an impact I made in the field. So there were two citations. Both of them were of a guy named G.M. Martin. So, so much, a little humility is, is a good thing. <laughs> So uh, the classical one that I mentioned was uh, cigarette smoking. And it impacts reproduction, cardiovascular, pulmonary uh, cancer. It's really a powerful agent. And you know, I, was in, I visit my daughter in California a lot. And when I was there, there was a, a public uh, relations campaign to have kids to stop smoking. And it showed something like this in a bar. Uh, with a, a good-looking guy and a nice-looking gal. There was a kind of electricity going between the two of them. Uh, and he took a big puff from his King cigarette, and all of a sudden, the cigarette went like that. <laughs> and it went like this. So that was followed by a very intelligent, specific description of what happens to the penile artery from smoking. It gets a big hit. That's what's going to stop kids from smoking. <laughs> you don't tell them you're going to get cancer in 40 years. It doesn't work. So it does, uh, it does uh, it decrease female fertility. This is called a 95% confidence limit. Everything on this side of the line means that it's almost certainly true that it decreases uh, the fertility of females. And so many, many studies have shown that. So now there may be anti-gerontogens, and uh, you know, eat your veggies, your, your blueberries, wine, resveratrol. My, my colleague, uh, Matt Cableine and, and Peter Rabinus who said, well, yeah, it's in red wine, but you have to have about maybe 200 bottles or something like that for it. So, and here, exercise, this is actually important. Social network is very important in, in maintaining uh, health span and, and lifespan, we think. And exercise. Exercise is getting a lot of attention. In fact, there's a wonderful experiment now uh, that has been published in which you take a mouse that has a mutation in the enzyme that copies the mitochondrial DNA. Turns out that mitochondrial little circular DNAs that are separate from the whole genome, and they're very important in giving you ATP, the power of the cell to generate energy, which you need for everything, including unwinding DNA. And so uh, they made a, a mutation was called the proofreading domain, domain of this enzyme, which is called DNA polymerase gamma, and it's only found in, in mitochondria. So it means, just like an editor's proofreading, they, make, they don't fix the mistakes that are made. And so it turns out these mice have terrible uh, problems that look like premature aging. They're really in bad shape. Well, these guys took th these mice and they forced them on a, on a treadmill to exercise. And mice like that. They like to run a lot. And, but they pushed them to, to in endurance limits. You know, they were just at the end. They did it for five months, three times a week. And then, it's amazing, they reversed a lot of the phenotype. Uh, it, it was just astonishing. And so they thought maybe there's a more uh, uh, bad mitochondria or getting eaten up, and there was more mitochondria made. Uh, needs a lot more research, but it, it is an important, and there's different kinds of exercise. So now the last part, and it looks like I'm going to just make it. Uh, it's uh, the business of nature. Again, this is what, uh, nature within a species. Why do we age differently? Already we know about uh, Werner's syndrome, but there are a whole bunch of mutations. And when you look at them, they take a big impact on the stability of your genome, the stability of DNA. Here's another one called the Hutchinson-Guilford progeroid syndrome, or progeroid of childhood. And there, the mutation is in the, uh, something called laminase C, and that makes a protein that lines the inner uh, nucleus. And it's very important in um, the integrity of the nucleus. And if actually, in these children, it's very misshapen. Uh, the nuclei, and in, in gene regulation, gene stability. 
they uh, make a, they actually have a, a deletion at the end of this gene such that it expresses a very rare isoform. There's something called splicing going on where different, different pieces of a gene are spliced together in different ways. And so one gene, you can have a lot of different products. And this is a rare isoform in normal, and it makes this bad product called progerin, which uh, has a post-translational modification on it. Uh, it's called farnesylation, and it drags it into the nucleus, and they get in big trouble. They can't get rid of this. And it turns out that we also have some of this as we get older. So it may inform us about, uh, particularly in the arterial wall. So this is a quite an interesting, new, relatively new discovery. So uh, this, this patient died at uh, a heart attack. This was my patient I saw many years ago. Developed a chondrosarcoma after she moved to Portland uh, at the age of around 10 or so. Now I just end it real quickly. There, uh, there are good genes too, not all bad. And there are two particularly, the best, uh, the best one in, uh, in centenarians, the fastest growing subset of the population, folks, centenarians, unprecedented. So uh, there's a gene called FOXO3A, and it turns out there's a variant of it that's enriched in these people, and guess what? It's, it's uh, the, basically the same gene as the DAF16 in the C. elegans pathway, which I mentioned, IGF1, it's downstream. It's a transcription factor, and it, like DAF16, it turns on a lot of downstream genes, including catalase or a form of catalase that we're interested in. So that's exciting. That's the best replicated, maybe about eight studies. Uh, this is not as good, uh, well replicated. The receptor for this insulin-like growth factor, there are, um, there are um, um, polymorphic variants that these are upstream of the FOXO3A. Uh, and that's in, uh, also in, in centenarians. So that's good news and there's more. I just want to finish by, uh, by recognizing Junko Oshima has been with me for years and years and is the uh, head of the molecular genetics uh, group. Uh, we have uh, International Registry of Verna Syndrome, uh, and uh, Nancy Hansen, I notice, is here. She was our genetic counselor for many, many years. So we have patients from all over the world, and we're dis we have over di 80 different types of mutations so far, and we're discovering some new mutations because the doctors say it's Verna Syndrome is something else. So it gives us a chance to find new mutations, and we find several of them so far. So that's it. Thanks so much. Yeah. take a few questions from the audience, but um, I just want to remind you guys, we can take a few questions, but he'll, you guys can also ask more questions outside yeah. of the lobby. Yeah, I'll be outside and happy to ask questions, uh, answer questions. <laughs> okay. Oh, we got one over there. Yes, please. Come, come closer. Yeah, I have high frequency hearing loss, which is common. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Martin. Excellent lecture. I have, I have two questions, if I may. Yes. First one, uh, concerning the question of why we age, you brought up a very good idea. It's maybe genes that, that help us to live long, do not get selected for, and that is why they are so, they are so rare. But could it be something in the other direction? Could it be something specifically making us old for an evolutionary advantage? Because, sure. Because, well, the, the point being, if, uh, if, uh, uh, if an individual is beyond the, the age of reproduction sure. or caring for the young, if, uh, if that individual lives very long, his genes may not have the chance to get, of getting passed on to the next generation. Whereas. If you have genes that actually knock out that individual and give the room to, to younger ones, those genes may actually have a higher chance of yep. getting passed on to the next generation. It's a good question, and I alluded to that briefly, didn't have time to expand. There's a guy by the name, a wonderful biologist in the late 19th century named August Weissman. He was the first one to cl clearly differentiate uh, the idea of what's happening in the germline, which is immortal, and what's happening in the somatic cells of your body, which is not mortal. 
uh, and he had that idea that it's, it's adaptive, it's good for you because it makes room, so to speak, in quotes, for the new generation. And there, uh, there are people today writing about the same thing. For example, uh, well, actually, to get uh, to follow up on that, my friend Tom uh, 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 Kirkwood from uh, University of Newcastle, he went with a, a German colleague and he reviewed all of August Weissmann's old papers. And it, he, he wrote a review on it. It turned out that he changed his mind. He said, this is unlikely. Uh, but there are other people, anthropologists are arguing that they can go in primitive villages today around the world, primitive group society, and they can document the transfer of wealth from the grandparents down to the lower generation and argue that's adaptive. I'm not convinced that they're isolated nowadays. That, uh, I, I will question that. Moreover, in terms of what we have genetically, we have to think in terms of the early days of speciation uh, and uh, what little uh, data we have, archaeological data, on dating remains, skeletal remains. There weren't very many grandmas and grandpas around. That said, now, I'm certainly contributing to the reproductive success of my kids, <laughs> and I hope my grandkids. So today it's different. Question. Yeah. That was my second yeah. question. Uh, because, well, it is the conventional wisdom that once you are past the age of reproduction, uh, evolution no longer cares about you, that natural selection peters mm. out as a force. On the other hand, in some species, well, notably us, there have been suggestions that living past a certain age might actually be helpful in that you can you can look after your grandchildren yep. and, and in that way uh, help your genes yep. pass on to the next Well, I, I welcome people to write about it and to do experiments about it. Uh, and so I think, you know, like, like physics, you worse in biology. Ne uh, nothing is ever completely closed. It's always an open issue. So thanks for your question. Any, anything else? Here, okay. We I guess should we go? I'm ask one last question. Uh, yeah. What is it you and Stan Gardler and Aram Motelsky are taking? Because I think you guys are onto something. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you guys are. Yeah, thanks, 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 thanks.